of uh, celebrating red books day uh, today we will be uh, discussing a very significant book uh, haunted by fire essays on caste class exploitation and emancipation uh, written by maithili shivraman and uh, published by left word in 2013 uh, maithili shivraman as uh, most of you surely know was a political activist who has made immense contribution to the women's movement and to the fight against caste oppression uh, she was associated uh, with the communist party of india marxist and was the former vice president of all india democratic women's association a living a promising career of the united nations uh, she came back to india and played a key role in organizing uh, she has passed away last year uh, fighting covid 19 the book uh, this book is a collection of essays uh, she has written during 1970s and uh, early 80s for various journals like the radical review economic and political weekly uh, the social scientist etc uh, essays in this book critically engage with a range of political as well as ideological issues uh, like uh, caste oppression uh, dravidian social movements uh, the questions of land and labor Uh, state violence uh, centrality of class struggle and socialist politics etc and uh, today uh, we are very uh, glad to have dr kalpana karnakaran and uh, v geeda uh, who have edited this book and uh, written a wonderful introduction uh, reflecting on the life and work of uh, maithili shivaraman as our speakers of this program uh, dr kalpana uh, is an as associate professor at the department of humanities and social sciences site madras Uh, her works and research interests are largely concerned with women and the questions of development and vidida is a social activist writer and historian who has written extensively on the questions of gender of uh, feminism and caste and thank you very much for accepting our invitation uh, for today's uh, discussion uh, uh, the plan is that uh, dr kalpana will speak for about 20 sorry yeah so for today's discussion the plan is that dr kalpana uh, will uh, speak for about 20 25 minutes about the book first and it will be followed by uh, we geeda's comments and reflections and and then we will open the floor for discussion i hope that is fine yeah okay then great okay um, now i request uh, uh, everyone to mute their mics and uh, we'll take up questions uh after uh, uh the presentations of uh, dr kalpana and vidita uh, so now i request kalpana to take over ma'am you are muted ah yes uh yeah let me also thank you um thank you so much uh um and I'm, i'm just trying to yeah thank you thank you navneet thank you all and uh, maybe uh, i should request all of you to please um, um uh, mute yourselves when somebody is speaking uh, and so that uh, the background echo is reduced to the maximum extent possible so i would uh, begin with that request and geeta and i will be taking the same amount of time in our presentation so i hope to not take more than 25 to 30 minutes and i think geeta will take the same time 25 to 30 minutes uh looking at the way we've structured it between us is that i will focus on the content of the book so i'll give you an introduction to what is in the book uh, assuming that uh, not all of you have actually read the book or not all of you are terribly familiar with the contents of the book and uh, what geeta will do as a historian is to contextualize the book with uh, and with reference to history politics contemporary events and so on so in a sense that will be some kind of uh, division of labor between us um so let me begin by uh, saying that uh, maithili i mean maithili has been introduced very well to all of you by navneet M many of you may not have required an introduction at all and chintabar also had this very nice write up introducing maithili so all that i'll start by way of saying about maithili is that she was a writer throughout her politically active life of about four decades 
starting from 1968 to about 2007, 2008. Um, so she was a writer as much as she was an organizer, an activist and a movement builder. And these dimensions of her persona were in fact linked to each other, uh, were interlinked, uh, fairly organic. And they fed into each other and reflected each other as well. And I think Maithili as the writer, vis-a-vis uh, -vis Maithili as the movement builder, the organizer, the activist, and uh, so on. Um, Haunted by Fire itself, as Napit said, which was published by Leftward in 2013, um, uh, in includes her writings over a limited period, a certain fixed period from 1968 to the very, from the time she started her political writing to the very early 1980s. Uh, Gita and I put it together uh, in 20, starting 2011, 2012, during a period that Maithili was already quite unwell and losing her memory. Uh, so where did Maithili write during, what were our sources for this book, Haunted by Fire? Here it is for those of you who have uh, perhaps not seen a hard copy of the book and its cover, uh, more on its cover a little bit later. So uh, these writings that we have sourced for this book uh, are from, um, well, for, from a, a diversity of sources. One of them is the Radical Review, a journal that might be founded and edited along with a few others in uh, Madras then, in Madras then. Uh, this was when Maitri had just returned to, uh, to Chennai. She was um, uh, a fiery idealist and anti-imperialist and a Marxist already by the time she came back to Chennai and was looking uh, to involve herself in political action, political thinking and so on. And there was a group called the Saturday Evening Club of young people all left in their thinking um, a, a young group that came together to talk about politics, to plan action, and the Radical Review, the journal that Maithili edited, was an outcome of the Saturday Evening Club. Apart from that, Maithili's writings for this book have been sourced from uh, the essays that she wrote for the seminar, for Mainstream, The Pioneer, The Times of India, The Times Weekly, uh, which was a newspaper then, and, and the uh, Economic and political weekly, of course. Um, and uh, in the Radical Review, just to say a little bit about the Radical Review here, because some of her important essays are from the Radical Review, uh, Maithili uh, uh, and the group uh, that founded the Radical Review wanted to discuss issues of the that concern the left internationally, not just in Tamil Nadu, not only in India. So there was a reportage from uh, Vietnam, from uh, Latin America, writing about what was happening in revolutionary movements, in anti-war movements, anti-imperialism, what was the advance on the front of anti-imperialism globally. At the same time, what was happening in Tamil Nadu with reference to agrarian struggle, with reference to industrial action, uh, trade union strikes. So basically there was an interest in workers' movements, workers' organizing and peasant organizing, which fed into the radical Um for, and I just wanted to add one more thing about the Economic and Political Weekly, which is that for the period that Maithili wrote for the EPW, which was between 1973, when the Radical Review folded up, Maithili began to write for the EPW. Maithili wrote entirely anonymously, right? She didn't put her name to any of the pieces that she wrote as a special correspondent for the Economic and Political Weekly for, for that nine to 10 year period. Uh, the two special correspondents who wrote anonymously and often wrote jointly during that period were Maithili and her partner, Karunakaran. Uh, some of those pieces, uh, both of them wrote, a few of them Karunakaran wrote and uh, many of them Maithili wrote. So it was really a sort of a joint partnership during those years when Maithili and Karunakaran wrote anonymously. They don't have their names for the EPW. So this is a little bit of the context. Um, now I can't be, how am I going to approach this book today? I can't, clearly can't do, it's a pretty thick book as you can see, and I can't do justice to the full book. So I'm going to be selective. I'm going to pick a few essays and give you a flavor, a sense of the kind of writing and the thinking that she did and the political action that sustained and fed that writing. Um, and uh, basically I'm just going to be asking the question of how can, how may we seek inspiration from her writing? What do we take back with us? And our own locations may be diverse. Some of us, all of us may be people, young people, many of you interested in politics, some of you academics, some of you uh, PhD scholars, MA students, BTEC students. Um, 
and writers and whatever it is, or how, how, what do we take back from this book? Um, so, um, so I, I, then, like I said, once again, I'm just picking essays. I'm not doing justice to everything that is in the book because I really can't do that. So with that, uh, Maitali's political journey begins with her visit to, when she returns to India, a couple of months after her return, she hears about the massacre of Kiev and Mani in Tanjavur district when 44 uh, landless agricultural laborers, all of them Dalit, many of them women and children are burnt alive by landlords and their henchmen in a small hut in the village of uh, Kiran. Uh, Maitali then, uh, within a week of, uh, of this ghastly um, uh, massacre, Maitali visits Kiran Mani in order to understand what exactly has happened and what led to this uh, event. Uh, Maitali then writes about Kiran Mani after that first visit, she goes back not only to Venmani, but to a number of other villages in eastern Tanjavur in the, in, in the, to the region. And she writes about uh, uh, Venmani and uh, many come to hear of Venmani and what actually happened, the political context, the economic context, the, uh, you know, the social characteristics of that tension of the, that period of very intense agrarian tension and strife from Maitali's writings. Um, so her first piece uh, that some of you may have seen in this collection, which is, oh, and this is the picture, by the way, uh, this is the picture, here is Maitali, here is uh, um, uh, Krishna Mar Jagannathan, uh, uh, who accompanied Maitali on her visit to Kiran Mani, and uh, this is, this must have been very early January 1969, when this was, uh, the photograph was taken, so this is also the cover picture of Haunted by Fire. So the first thing that Maitali sees on the basis of her interaction, her interviews with a range of people in uh, Venmani village is the discrepancy between what actually transpired at Venmani and how the mainstream media chose to write about it. Maitali is quite angry and the tone of Venmani and the free press is one of anger and biting sarcasm, right? Because the free is within quotations, Venmani and the free press. And what she's trying to tell us is definitely uh, if the press is not free of class and caste bias, uh, judging both from the editorials written by fairly prominent editors of these newspapers, as well as their correspondents, reportage. Uh, since much of the action is portrayed as two groups of Kisans who are just fighting each other, the landlord is forced to import labor during the period of the harvest because really what can he do? Uh, the local labor is being unreasonable, asking for a wage hike every year. Uh, so the landlord and being instigated by the CPIM, so the landlord then imports uh, labor from outside. Uh, and it's really the local labor and the imported labor, the outside labor that fight each other. So it's the poor fighting each other. And what do you expect in a sense from uncultured, uh, quote unquote, uncultured uh, laborers? Uh, so this is the tone and very much the language and the thrust of much of the newspaper editorials and writing on Kevin Money. Uh, and the, the landlord in this, in this narration, the landlord almost recedes into the background, a, an innocent and blameless spectator, you know, sort of modestly retreating from the, from the scene. Uh, and in fact, uh, there are, there, there's a statement in one newspaper that the communist laborers set fire to their own huts. Uh, this was a, an atrocious claim that was made by one of the uh, newspapers. Then so, Michael then, her, her really, she's talking about what Ben Mani says about the so-called free press, well, free, but certainly not free of its own, very entrenched class and caste biases. On whose side is the press? Is the question that Michael Lee is asking us. Um, you see the same tone of biting anger and sarcasm in her other uh, very fine piece of political writing, The Gentleman Killers of Kay Ben Mani, uh, in which she takes on and she takes apart the Madras High Court judgment of 1973, which acquits, does not convict, but acquits all the 23 who were charged. They all happen to be Miras Das. Uh, and uh, in the words of the judgment, the judges are, uh, um, are uh, find that these all those who are charged are very, very wealthy men with huge land ownings. Some of them even own cars. So, they, so the judges say, we can't believe that such wealthy men would so, such powerful and wealthy men would directly commit such a crime as they have been charged. They're more likely to have got there. It's more likely their servants who carried out the attack. So all of them get acquitted. And therefore, Michael writes with great irony, 
that uh, the learned judges must realize that gentlemen farmers can be gentlemen killers. And that's why the piece is titled The Gentlemen Killers of Fear and Money. And the core of my piece argument to summarize all her writing on Ben Money is something that she keeps going back to, which is it is not a mere wage dispute. Once again, as many of the mainstream newspapers seem to be portraying it to be, it's not. In fact, the wage issue was secondary, both from the point of view of the landlords and even the workers themselves. Um, what Michael Lee does is to also interview the landlords and members of the Paddy Producers Association. Basically, it's basically a landlord association in which one landlord makes it very clear in his interview. He says, in the interview that he gave Michael Lee, he says, the fellow who used to fold his hands before us and would stand outside the back door now shows up at my front door, uh, Munvasal, wearing slippers. His leader, so he's talking about the Kisan. His leader parades my street with his flag, the red flag. He wants to plant his flag in the, pub, in the public place. And every evening at 5.30, uh, the worker says he has to go because there is a meeting. Thanks to the communists, the workers have no fear in them anymore. So this is a very key interview that Michael uses then to show us how it is precisely, it is not even so much wages which were secondary, but it is the independent political assertion of uh, caste oppressed landless labor, which is what has angered the landlords because that is really the most powerful challenge to the status quo that there can be. Uh, the fact that they have workers have now chosen landless labor have chosen to organize themselves they have their own association uh the red flag union and they march and organize themselves under the through the red flag union so this is really it's a fight for dignity uh it's a fight for the right to independently organize to choose their politics which is at stake as might be makes us see um she also shows us the complexity of the situation where um in in uh, in Eastern Tanjavur, Dalit landless agricultural labor become a staunch support base for the Communist Party. The identification of the communists with the section of the population of, the la of landless labor is so complete that given the rigid, very stratified caste order of Tanjavur, it makes it difficult for the party to also appeal to um, other landless and small peasants who are caste Hindus. So mostly uh, uh, caste Hindus, small peasants, and some landless sections who are caste Hindus in order to create a wider political formation, to build a wider political solidarity. So Michael Lee shows us the complexity of the situation and the landlords evidently want to use this divide to their advantage because when they sometimes import labor from outside, they are also importing caste Hindu landless and caste Hindu small peasants and placing them against Dalit lands uh, who are being mobilized by the CPIM. So this is something that Michael Lee, Michael Lee is able to show us this complexity. And she also shows us in, in her pieces, especially in the piece which is called the rumblings of class struggle in Tanjabur, that the Benmani episode is not, the massacre is not an isolated occurrence. One, you don't understand it. If you see it as an isolated occurrence, but you, see, you must see it against the political and economic backdrop of capitalist farming in Tanjavur, what capitalist farming has done, and the green revolutions and the changes it has wrought in the agrarian structure of Tanjavur. So she's also using data on, and she presents us a wealth of supporting evidence, supporting data on um, tenancies, on how insecure tenancies are, a uh, tenant can be evicted at any point of time uh, by a landlord. The, the helplessness and the powerlessness of tenants, the pattern of land ownership, the concentration of land ownership in Tanjavur, the extremely skewed pattern of land ownership, the extent of absentee landlordism. So Michael is using census 1961 data. She's using the latest, the secondary literature very rigorously. Um, a study by uh, Francine Frankel on Tanjavur in 1969, uh, Wolf Lajensky, who is a Ford Foundation consultant to the government of India and who had studied tenancy structures in Tanjavur district. All of this feeds into Maitri's argument and she shows us therefore how this is right for an explosion, right? The context that, that in a sense creates this explosion. Um, 
uh, we must also keep in mind that Maithili was visiting not only Venmani, but Kovil Patte, Valliyanallur, Alathambadi, Puducherry. So a number of villages. She's also establishing her contacts with the CPIM, Agricultural Workers Union. When she goes to K. Venmani, she's just returned from the US a few weeks or a few months before that. So she is not a member of the CPIM yet, right? It is also through her writings on K. Venmani that CPIM leaders then come into contact with my uh, So she uses then her growing contacts with the CPIM Workers Union to visit a number of other villages in Eastern Tanjavur. And uh, in this paper, The Rumblings of Class Struggle, which is another political classic, another masterpiece of writing, um, what is interesting is the title, which is Rumbling. It's not a outburst of thunder. It, it's, it's a rumbling, you know? So she's, she then using these contacts, mightily visits and speaks to the Kisan Union in villages in which there is actual conflict and it is like a war zone. There's pitched fighting, there's been pitched fighting. But then, then there's also villages in which there was a history of conflict and tension, but the red flag cannot fly in those villages anymore. The laborers, the Kisans have withdrawn their strike have withdrawn, have gone back to the landlord's uh, fields and farms, having no other options since there's no other employment. Um, and she also visits villages in which there has been no history of struggle, right? In which the status quo, the agrarian status quo remains undisturbed. Um, and uh, here is the, wherever she goes, she asks, uh, when will the red flag fly here? Or when will the red flag fly again? If it was a question of a setback in a, in a standoff between landlords and landless labor. Uh, so this is the nature of Maithili's writing on the explosive violence that Kevin Mani was. But she also, in other pieces in this book, in two other pieces, uh, dissects everyday life. She also dissects everyday life of the normal caste society. You could call it the caste normal, right? And here you have a sense of the kind of ethnographic study and writing that she has done. She shows us how caste is woven into the everyday normal life of the village. It underwrites the caste normal of the village. There are two uh, pieces of writing here, one on Ratnapuri, the village Ratnapuri, the other on Kartur, where Maithili observes closely every facet of social life, of the village economy, of the caste-determined division of labor, who does what, the, and provides elaborate descriptive detail of the wealth of work, of labor that Dalits perform for the village and how their labor is indispensable. It forms the bedrock, the fulcrum of the village economy, even as they remain excluded and shut out from the village social or the village public. The tone in the piece on Ratnapuri, if any of you saw it, which is the first paper here in this series, is sort of light. It's also racy and it's angry. And you can see Michael is drawing on her uh, experiences of being in the US. She refers to the seeding anger of on the streets of Harlem. She talks of, she, she mentions uh, uh, the hot, bloody summers of the hot, bloody summer of Harlem. She's talking about the US in the mid 1960s and the way the social status quo there was disturbed by uh, the anger of Black Americans, of African Americans filling into the streets. Um, so that's Maitali's frame of reference, really, when she's writing that piece. On the other hand, the Khartoum paper, the paper on Khartoum, uh, is more measured writing. The tone is more measured. The pace is slower. She seems to have visited the village over several agricultural seasons and cycles to understand what is happening there. And she's placing that in the context of Indian social sciences, uh, sociology and political science literature, trying to understand caste, trying to understand the history of caste. That's the background she gives to the paper. So in both papers, though, the, uh, here in the paper on Ratnapuri and the paper on Kartur Maitali is showing us very clearly that if you take away caste hierarchies, you understand nothing about rural life. And at the same time, if you take away or if you don't see the structural denial of rights over land, you don't fully understand caste either. You don't fully understand how caste works or one of its important organizing principles either. So she makes us see that very clearly. The piece on um, uh, Kartur has a very moving petition uh, that Maithili has incorporated and that she re reproduces in detail, a petition by the landless Dalit poor of Kartur village to the government um, uh, for, for Porombok land, for ownership, claiming 
the ownership, the rightful ownership of Porambok land that they had been cultivating uh, and working for about 15 years. Uh, and suddenly the government has seen fit to reassign the land to two completely unrelated persons living in Madras with the collusion of the panchayat that has accepted the government's uh, 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 position here, the government's move here, and the, the panchayat is completely in the control of caste Bindu. So Maithili is also, what Maithili is doing here is, remember that she's writing in these pieces in 1968-69, so really 1969, which is the Gandhi centenary year, 100 years, uh, Gandhi having been born in 1869. And, and Maithili is therefore, in a sense, really uh, taking on board uh, uh, Gandhian philosophy, Gandhian ideology, and she's asking some hard questions. For instance, it is the Gandhian vision of community development that underlies the community development programs that India pursued. No, for the first two decades of Indian independence, it was the until the Green Revolution happened. It was really the community development program that sort of set the the, the tone of uh, rural intervention uh, of the of the government of state policy. And so, Maitri then. Um, uh, you know, takes on this notion, the Gandhian idea that over a period of time, a sense of community that transcends caste, that transcends family loyalties will naturally or automatically evolve through interventions of the Gandhian kind. And Michael says that has not happened, nor is that likely to happen. And that's very clearly visible here. So it's, it's Michael's Marxist uh, uh, vision also that makes her see that and makes her, and makes her, uh, enables her to make a very strong claim that awakening social conscience through the principle of private initiative or the trusteeship principle, the Gandhian trusteeship principle uh, is not something that is going to work because how, how do you, how can you change nature uh, with, with just personal effort alone, change human nature with just personal effort without, without upsetting institutional relations, right? So that's, that's really what Michael is arguing here. Um, during the 1970s, then, so when Maitri begins, throws herself into full-time action as a CPIM full-timer, she does so not in uh, rural uh, Tamil Nadu, but in the cities and the factories and uh, of Madras, because she becomes a frontline organizer of the night of the CITU, the Center for Indian Trade Unions. Maitri, B.P. Chintan, Usela, these are some of the big names of the. Uh, some of the very massive strikes that Tamil Nadu witnessed during the 1970s, companies like Simpsons, the MRF, Standard Motors, Ashok Leyland, uh, Balu Garments, Ta Tablets India, were some of the big units that went into strike. There were waves of strikes and agitations, one after the other. Maitali is written on many of them, and we have just one or two of them in this collection. More of them should be appearing uh, later. And here again, I just want you to want to give you a a flavor of how does she approach when she writes about trade unions and workers' movements. So I gave you a sense of how she writes about caste, the caste normal, or how she writes about explosive caste class violence and how she writes about agrarian unrest. So how does she then write about workers' unions and worker organizing, right? Um, she lays out the terrain for us, the larger picture. And she does this even more elaborately in her writing on the trade unions. For instance, the paper on the Madras rubber factory, the MRF, right, which makes tires and tubes, which had, as she writes, on the strike of the MRF strike, a fairly heroic strike over close to 100 days, which broke out in April of 1971. Uh, but she doesn't sort of begin with the strike. She lays out the, the larger picture for us, a very compelling picture. She shows us the history, the origins of the rubber industry in India with the establishment of Dunlop Rubber Company in 1936. Then she show, takes us through how the auto tire industry develops in India. What were its internal uh, growth impetus? What were, what were its contradictions? Um, it, what kind of a monopoly was it? How did it rely on collaboration with foreign capital? How critical this collaboration was? And then she locates within this picture the MRF, which uh, goes public in the 1960s, and how the MRF is both fighting new competitors at the same time trying to carve out a place for itself in the face of very established old companies like the Dunlop, right? So she's showing us that picture. And she also makes us see how even after going public, the MRF is very well able to preserve the interests of its founding family. They've lost nothing. They continue to draw very large salaries. How does it do that? She shows us that. 
Um, the company has no problem securing loans from private sources or governmental sources. So Michael is then looking at the statements, the speeches and the books, the annual general body meetings of the MRF to build for us a picture of a company that is doing fairly well financially, that is doing fairly well in terms of its growth, but is looking to grow further. And uh, this is, it is within this picture that she situates labor unrest. And I think it's important because this is something Maithili always did in all her writing on trade unions movements and in her action as well. She would, in her activism as well, she would take on the claim of the, the, the company's concern, right? The factory concern that where do they have the surplus? They're not making profits. How are they going to be able to meet the wage rise claims of the workers or the bonus claims of the workers, etc.? So Maithili would take on that claim by showing that actually the companies are doing pretty well. It's exorbitant profits that they are making and what workers are, in the light of that, what workers are claiming for themselves is not on view at all, right? So this is something that you see. In fact, it is... Uh, uh, there are her writings often included would include calculations from the balance sheets of companies to show therefore to make a claim uh, for for uh, you know which side you must take in this battle given that these companies are doing fairly fairly well. Um, so back to the MRF story then Maithili also shows us not just the larger context of industry and capital and what is happening there but also the history of the union itself from its very early days when it was uh, when it moved from say to form some very gradually and a, a period of uh, settling issues with the owner of the company the mudalali through just over coffee and sweets and coming to a compromise very soon so it moves from that stage to one of increasing militancy and class action and growing class consciousness finally it takes us through the history of the union so finally when the strike of april 1917 breaks out then the union has really come of age because it's able to bring together under its banner it's able to bring together workers from other factories workers across political parties and workers across uh, the language and uh, from different languages as well uh, and different uh, castes come together under the red flag union um Michael also shows us in this paper on the mrf how the state uses its coercive power to divide workers as malayali and non-malayali workers that's what i meant by the language issue here, right? So how the state is using uh, its coercive apparatus, it's using the police to break the strike, it's using, um, it's jailing the leaders, it's intimidating workers, it's using whatever it can to divide workers. And as Maitri says, um, what a favorite sort of tactic of divide was the Malayali versus the non-Malayali worker, even though the Tamil chief minister and the Tamil and the Malayali owner of the company were very happy and willing to join hands, right? In terms of keeping the industry in peace. So she sort of gives us that complete picture. And, um, and also, how does the union decide what tactic it will use? So when do you go for a face a very intense battle? And then when do you scale it down? When you, when you, you know, lower it down a few notches, when the repressive power pressure is too intense. So the tactic to be used depends on the circumstance and it's being worked out on the moment in the field as mightily makes us see and feel. And the outcome of these battles is never predetermined. No, you get that sense in Maithili's writing so clearly. It is being worked out and Maithili is recording it from the front lines. So it's one step forward at the same time as she shows us the setbacks, the reversals, the betrayals and the contradictions uh, and the repressions. Well, uh, likewise, her writing on the plantation sector she looks at uh, the Anamalai Hills, the plantation in uh, uh, the plant the green industry and its wage slaves is what that piece is called. And when she writes of plantations, she takes us right back to uh, while the struggle itself was in May of 1972 when it broke out in the Anamalai Hill plantations. Mightily takes us back to colonial India to the establishment of plantations under the British, various commissions of inquiry, what did they say about plantations? What was the condition of labor, of labor capital relationships historically from the period that plantations were established, at least in South India, uh, right up to current times? And how did she also see she's not only making us see how unions organize and mobilize, she's also making us see how capitalism works. She's showing us how capitalism in the plantation sector emerged, what enabled it, what sustained it, how did it make its profits? How did the state 
uh, enable it as well to grow and to thrive. So she's giving us a history of capital and she's giving us a history of labor. And I think that's something that we absolutely must keep in mind. And this piece is particularly poignant. I hope many of you go back to read it. She also talks about uh, how women workers in the struggle uh, plays, played a very heroic role in the struggle, the story of Mailai uh, as well. And uh, Michael, you must know, was a powerful writer in Tamil as well. And Tamil, what she has written on this struggle called Valparayin Virakavyam was considered an extremely moving and powerful piece of writing um, uh, that was very widely read and circulated uh, during the period of this struggle. Um, so, uh, so I think what I'm trying to convey, and I, I hope I'm able to do that, is that Maithili documents both the making of power, of structures of power, and the resistance to it, right? You, you see both. And that is what makes her writing so engaging, but also so intensely political. Um, and of course, Michael also makes us see in Haunted by Fire and these pieces that we put together that it's not only movements or workers' movements or people's movements that resist the state. It can also be individuals who resist heroically uh, the occupation of their bodies by the state, who heroically resist acts of terrible cruelty and violence inflicted on them by the state, by the police, on them or on their loved ones. And here I'm speaking of section five of this book, which is called Repression and Resistance, and is actually about um, individuals acting in defense of their civil liberties, taking on the might of the police and the state and the entire political class when terrible human rights abuses uh, occur. And mightily, uh, and uh, the, in this case, uh, the All India Democratic Women's Association that she was heading then, the AIDWA that she was heading then, is a very staunch and committed ally of, uh, of those who fight. And uh, there are just, I'm just going to very briefly talk about two of the papers here, the case of Nagamal and the case of Siralan, both of which, both the, 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 the violence against both Siralan and Nagamal, took place during the period of the emergency. Siralan was, in, uh, was from Atiur village in North Akar district, barely 20 years old when he died of police torture. He was suspected of being an axolite. A yoke was tied around his neck and two policemen stood on either side and seesawed, uh, breaking his neck and, and then beating him to death. Uh, it was Bakyam, the mother of Siralan, who took up the case and who fought it, who sought out the assistance of uh, Maithili who, and the uh, uh, Edwa then that Maithili was heading. Uh, the other case, Nagamal, a peasant woman from South Arcot district, who was detained illegally in a police station for over five weeks and subject to torture, rape, sexual assault and torture, and her husband as well. Uh, as Maithili shows us in her piece on Nagamal, the story of Nagamal, she was a remarkable woman uh, because she was determined to have to pursue uh, those who had committed these atrocities on her and to have justice at any cost. Um, and uh, she was tireless, really, in, in, in demanding justice. She made a trip to Delhi to meet the then Prime Minister Moraji Desai. And she even deposed before the Shah Commission because of her persistence. She deposed before the Shah Commission that was set up under Justice Shah to inquire into excesses committed during the period of the emergency. Uh, but as Michael Lee writes, Sadly, what happened to Nagamal was not an emergency excess at all, but what happened was standard political excess, right? Committed as part of routine police interrogation that happens at all times, both before it continues to happen after the emergency as well. Uh, in both cases, Nagamal and Siralan, what Michael makes us see in her pieces is that landlords were in collusion with the police, with state power. In fact, uh, there was a report that when Siralan was tortured and murdered, the local landlords threw a feast for the police to celebrate and to thank them for their, uh, uh, for their act because he had led, over months, he had led a wage struggle of the landless in his native village. Likewise, Nagamal had married a Dalit man, had taken up the issues of uh, Dalits in, in their village and had challenged the power of the dominant castes in that village. Who had then, it, it was believed that it was at their behest that the police had carried out uh, the illegal confinement and torture of Nagamal and her husband. Um, so Maithili, as the head of Aidwa, took up the cases of both Nagamal and Bakyam, Bakyam for her son, Siralan, 
And I was told, although I have no memory of this, that Nagamal would used to come uh, to our home very often early mornings. Maitri would wake up to find Nagamal with her yellow cloth bag, uh, waiting to meet Maitri, waiting to talk to her, ask her what is happening with the case, what can they do next, uh, how can they get her justice. Such was the drive and courage of Nagamal. Uh, both these papers, Nagamal and Sri Ralan, Maitri wrote in 1977 and 1978, but Maitri stayed with these cases over a period of time. She writes again on Sri Ralan. That's not in this book, uh, but I just want to mention that for a, for a minute. She writes again on Sri Ralan's case in 1995 that was carried by the front line then, when his mother, Bakiam, was awarded a compensation of uh, one lakh by the High Court uh, as compensation for the loss of a breadwinner son. So Maitri stays with these cases because she's also, in a sense, uh, uh, representing uh, 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 these cases. So, uh, so finally, the last section, and I should be finishing very soon, is Maitri's writings as a left internationalist. Because Maitri, we must remember, became a Marxist. She, she came of age politically during the 1960s in the US. Uh, those were the years of the uh, civil rights struggles, those were the years of Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, of the Vietnam War, the protests over the Vietnam War, and second wave feminism. Maitri had all, she still, we still have in our home, um, all the second wave classics, the feminist classics uh, that Maitri had picked up and read and absorbed and obviously discussed with her friends and comrades over her years in, uh, during the period that she stayed in the US, which was between 1963 and 1968. And her piece is a very fine piece of writing. Uh, called Towards Emancipation, which you may have seen is in the last section of the book. She brings together her feminist reading, also of the second wave classics, but and her abiding commitment to Marxism, uh, not as dogma, but as a form of scientific inquiry that, that helps us understand more clearly uh, material realities. And uh, so you see mightily the Marxist theoretician, the Marxist feminist theoretician, at her finest in this piece towards emancipation. So I want to finally end with her Cuba writing. Um, her, uh, visits to, her visit to Cuba in 1968, just before she returned to India from the uh, US was something that happened uh, clandestinely. It had to happen in secrecy because if the US knew uh, it would not, if that she had gone to Cuba, it would not allow her to re-enter uh, re uh, uh, the US. So Maitri had to fly through Mexico, visit Cuba, and then on the way back from Cuba to Mexico, she was, uh, she, with, the, with the help of Cuban authorities, of course, she was brought back to Mexico in a postal airplane. So it was a really small airplane, with, and as Maitri would describe it, it just had the, uh, it had the pilot, the postman, sacks of letters, and Maitri. That was all there was in the plane, so that the stamp of having visited Cuba would not be there. Uh, on her passport. Uh, so that was, but Maitri spent um, three weeks extensively traveling through uh, Cuba, where she met a wide spectrum of people. And what really she found compelling about socialist Cuba was the, was the mandate, was the social mandate, uh, the revolutionary mandate in a sense, that everybody must engage in manual labor, in physical labor, uh, ministers, bureaucrats, writers, politicians, whoever artists, whoever they were. For instance, every even Maitri visited, every Cuban was required to spend 30 to 45 days in a year in the fields, working in the farms and fields. And especially in April, which was the season of the, the month of the sugar harvest, everything would be shut down, allowing everyone to go and work in the fields. Because the success of the revolution in the case of Cuba depended on this national agricultural endeavor. Right? It depended on Cuba being able to feed itself and produce sufficient to feed itself. Uh, so that was a revolutionary mandate, really. And Maitri was, um, is quite evidently uh, very struck uh, when she goes to the Cuban foreign office to meet an official, but she's told that it is his turn to work. He's gone off to work in the farms and she must wait until he comes back. Uh, and so when Maitri writes this piece, she, she uh, makes it a point to emphasize the dignity of manual labor that has been consciously cultivated by socialist Cuba. And she writes in that piece, I come from India where manual labor is derogated, right? And um, while Gandhi emphasized the dignity of labor and India seems to be following the path of Gandhi, it's really socialist Cuba that is truer to the, to the spirit of Gandhian thought. 
Um, so uh, hence the title of this piece is Gandhian Court in, in Cuba. Uh, and uh, her other piece on education in Cuba might be struck by the national drive to eliminate illiteracy and, its, and some of its stunning achievements uh, and of a whole army of about a lakh, 100,000 youngsters who are divided into thousands of literacy brigades and who go into villages to stay in villages and to teach both parents and their children in peasant homes. So tackling both adult illiteracy as well. Uh, so it's, it's that which also uh, mightily finds so compelling about uh, uh, revolutionary socialist uh, Cuba. And uh, so clearly you can see in these pieces on Cuba that what inspires mightily is she sees that every citizen identifies with the, with the spirit of the revolution. So every citizen, in a sense, is a revolutionary, right? Um, and but we must keep in mind that she's visiting only a decade after the revolution, right? So it's just in 1968 that Michael is. So that fervor that Michael sees on the streets is something that clearly infuses Michael also with the uh, with the longing, the desire to come back to India and to transform India along the lines of Cuba. So that's the that's the light in which we must see Michael's writings on Cuba. So I finally want to end this by just saying this last point, which is what is the role of intellectuals in a socialist state? I mean, Michael asks this question in her piece, education in Cuba, what must the university be like in a socialist state, right? How must intellectuals be? How must they remake themselves? And she says they can't be an exclusive elite anymore. They cannot keep aloof from social and historical practice. They cannot cut themselves off from the struggles of the people. The university as an institution must participate also in revolutionary activity, which means the university must involve itself with addressing the challenges and the problems thrown up by the revolution. Um, so Maitali really says this. She says, socialist Cuba could not accept a scholar, however eminent in his field as an intellectual, unless he was committed to the revolutionary idea. He had to be a partisan. She means a partisan in the cause of the people. So I want to end by saying this was my thing. She was a partisan, right? She was a partisan. She threw herself into addressing, thinking about, writing about the challenges of social movements, power and the resistance to power, the big issues of her times and her age. She may, while she may not have thought of herself along these lines, I think that she embodied the revolutionary intellectual, right? That she writes off in the context of Cuba, right? The intellectual has to be then has to remake himself or herself to be a revolutionary intellectual uh, by throwing themselves into the task of rebuilding uh, socialist Cuba. And I think this is uh, this this was the intellectual that Michael was, and uh, haunted by fire. This collection testifies to that in my view. So I'm going to uh, thank you and uh, end with this on this note and please hand it back to uh, Navneet. Over to you, Navneet. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kalpana. Uh, it was a very insightful uh, introduction uh, to the book uh, as well as the political life and activism of uh, Michael Shivaraman. I think uh, now I request uh, B. Gita to uh, present her uh, comments and thoughts, and then we will open the floor for discussion. Thanks very much, um, Chintabar uh, and friends at Chintabar. So Kalpana has laid out this very fascinating life and work of Maitri Sivaraman, who has been a source of inspiration for many of us, um, fellow traveling with the left or being part of the women's movements in the city and elsewhere in Tamil Nadu. So what I wish to do is to actually pick up from where Kalpana left off that Maithili uh, may or may not have defined herself as a partisan left intellectual, but that's what she was. And she uh, cited her um, um, a piece of text from her essay on Cuba. So I want to actually position Maithili's thought, work and politics within a, a broader historical framework. Um, and I see this framework as comprising three parts. One is the long um, durée of left um, uh, thinking and activism around issues of uh, uh, agrarian class, of 
mobilizing agrarian labor, of, of industrial uh, labor, um, and how the left viewed matters to do with caste and class. So there's a history uh, of practice as well as a history of ideas within which I would like to situate Maitley's own writings. Then there's the particular history of communist thought in the Tamil context, much of which is available only in, in the Tamil language, not all of it has been translated. And that would be interesting for us to uh, know a bit about as well, so that we can see Maitali's life and work in parallel with developments within Tamil Nadu as well. And lastly, um, I want to also mark the very distinctive historical trajectory that she essayed as a Marxist intellectual, as an organizer on the ground, and as an as a feminist activist. So that's the last part of my talk. So let me start with a broad uh, historical overview of communist um, reflections and practice and on the agrarian economy, on industrial labor and so on. I'm not going to go into great detail, except to sort of plot broad issues at stake for the left from the time that the Communist Party was formed in the 1920s and until the first few decades after independence. So one of the issues that um, communist organizers and thinkers in India have had to address with respect to the agrarian economy is how do we understand the pattern of land holdings, social relations of production, and the very complex and contradictory tensions on the ground between Kisans and agricultural laborers who are mostly landless. So these issues have uh, haunted communist uh, thought and organizing on the agrarian question from the late 1920s onwards. And for the first time in the history of communist thought, they were addressed with great finesse and subtlety by Swami Sahajanand, who was part of the All India Kisan Sabha, and who was organizing in what you would today call Eastern UP and, and large parts of Bihar. And Swami Sahajanand recognized that in material terms, in terms of the kind of everyday life that the small peasant, someone who had barely half an acre of land to two acres of land, and Dalit, all, almost always Dalit agricultural laborer, the material realities of both these sections of society were not all that different. So landlessness was a constitutive feature of agrarian economic life in broad swaths of the Indo-Gangetic plain. And typically, uh, Kisan who had very little land, whose land had been taken away because of indebtedness, who had lost land because of appropriation by landlords, um, who had been cheated out of his share of land by a scheming family that takes up with the broader landlord section, who had been reduced to a tenant. His life, Swami Sahajanand argued, was not very different from the life of the landless agricultural laborer who had no land, who could expect to make no claims on land, and who had only his or labor or her labor to fall back upon. So this is the sort of thinking that opened up within the communist ranks in the 1920s, but particularly in the 1930s. And for communist organizing, this posed some very interesting and challenging questions. So how would you unite the small Kisan and the Dalit agricultural laborer, because they would come together if they had to challenge a landlord uh, who had put both of them in precarious economic conditions, but they were also divided in the village because of their caste status. Well, there were agricultural laborers who were non-Dalit, a bulk of agricultural labor across India was Dalit or in some parts, Adivasi and Dalit. So this being the reality on the ground, for organizers, this posed a huge challenge in terms of what is the nature of communist organizing to be like in these circumstances. And I'm sure we have histories of such organizing for different parts of India, and a close look at those histories would reveal how fraught that exercise was for activists on the ground. And the most interesting study in this respect is, of course, the classic uh, uh, account by P. Sundaraya on the Telangana armed struggle, which was basically a struggle against bonded labor or vetti as it was called on the one hand, and for Kisans to have better tenancy rights and if possible to ha have land made out of their own names. But on the ground, Sundaraya tells us, you often face this piquant situation where after you had 
successfully evicted the landlord from that piece of land. And remember, this was a militant arms struggle. The real problem came up when it came to redistributing land because very few Kisans were willing to part with land to Dalit agricultural laborers. And often the Communist Party found itself having to convince Kisans that they must give up a bit of their land. And this did not transpire in 80 to 90% of the cases. And much of the land that communists then made over to the Dalit agricultural laborers was really what today we would call Porambok or wasteland or the village commons and so on. And this is something that features in Maithili's uh, writings as well on, on East Tanjavur, where there is this constitutive tension for the communist activist who has to bring together the small Kisan and the um, landless agricultural laborer. And where do they stand united? Where do their interests, material interests, as well as their caste status pull them apart is a question that is constantly evolving and changing. And Maithili was one of the few communist thinkers who was very aware of both aspects of the question. So she does not reduce caste to class. She does not say that caste is really a cultural phenomenon and the fundamental problem is the economy. Once you sort out the economic crisis, the caste issue will be taken care of. What she instead says is in her early essays that the caste issue is one of the many strands that activism has to take on when it mobilizes in the countryside. But the fundamental issue for socialists has to be the economic issue. So she's not downgrading the caste issue. Instead, she's saying it has to be a necessary part of communist activism, but the communists have to address the material reality of landlessness, low labor, low wages, and the very precarious conditions of tenancy. Then who would address the caste issue? Communists must necessarily address the caste issue, is what she says. And she brings out this with sort of in a very fundamental way in her essay, The Relevance of Periyar, where after reviewing Periyar's uh, life as an anti-caste crusader, his critique of Hinduism, his critique of Brahmin hegemony, um, and she raises this set of fundamental questions along with Karunakaran towards the end of that essay where she says, how are we going to conceptualize caste in terms of both the ownership of the means of production as well as the relationships of production? How does caste shape capitalism? What does caste have to do with gender? So she raises a set of issues which she feels socialists must address as socialist issues. And I think this is Mike Lee's uh, very fundamental contribution as a Marxist theorist that she sees caste as not an epiphenomenon, not as an issue only for anti-caste movements or the state or for popular movements to address, but as an issue that communists must necessarily address. And in this sense, she was actually picking up a strand from people like, people like Sahajanand and others, but also rethinking it within a specific context of Tamil Nadu, where there had been a very strong anti-Brahmanical and anti-caste movement from almost the late 19th century. So Maitley's manner of doing theory is not to start with abstract categories or caste and class, are they the same? Uh, is caste an epiphenomenon? Is caste cultural and is class economic? Rather, she situates them within different levels of what Marxists call the social totality. And then she asks socialists to consider each level of that totality as important for socialist organizing and socialist politics. So that's quite interesting the way she does that. Likewise, she does, she raises questions about the future of socialist organizing in terms of what do you do when the peasant and the laborer are pulled in two different directions? How do you work with that contradiction? While she doesn't give you any definitive answers, she points to the centrality of acknowledging this contradiction for any future activism on the ground. So that's another very, very interesting um, move that she makes theoretically, and also a move that is of practical significance. And then thirdly, what do you do with the state? Kalpana pointed out in the course of her discussion of many of Maitli's articles that the state is not a neutral bystander. The state actively takes a part of capital of landlords of caste Hindus. So how do you then work with the state? For Maitri, this really poses a conundrum because while she sees the role as of the state as being um, important in certain ways, there are certain functions that the state has to necessarily fulfill. The state, appealing to the state cannot be a substitute for organizing on the ground. 
Well, appealing to the state is important. That cannot be a limiting factor for socialist politics. Organizing labor, rendering labor politically self-conscious is what the communists have to set themselves to do. That she makes clear even in her early essays written in the late 1960s, and in particularly in the essays where she gets into the nitty gritty of organizing, whether it's organizing industrial labor or plantation workers or agrarian labor and small peasants in East Anjao. So how do you then deal with the state? The state cannot be viewed as a neutral body. The state is necessarily a class and caste state. And as she would tell us with her essay on, on feminism, it is also an extremely gendered entity. So I think Maitley's conceptualization of the state is classically Leninist in certain ways, but she also sees a certain role for the state which cannot be wished away, but which cannot define the socialist engagement with the state. So this also explains her kind of uh, political and, and I, I guess philosophical unease with electoral democracy. So in her early essays, you see her sort of uh, pointing to what the Naxalites have managed to do. She references Kanu Sanyal and his group in, in West Bengal, and she points to how they have gone the revolutionary way, gone the way of armed militancy. While she does not advocate that as a cause, she does lay stress on revolutionary action. So therefore, for her, the state cannot really define the limits of socialist politics. And in her essays on electoral politics in Tamil Nadu, on uh, where she analyzes what happens during elections, what is the role assigned to the parliamentary left, she sort of wonders what is it that makes the water come to the communists when it's a wage struggle or when it's a struggle against oppression in the, against the local police, but then what makes them vote for the DMK or the Congress? And this is a question that she leaves open and um, she does not think that electoral democracy can advance socialist prospects beyond a fairly limited, uh, you know, in a, beyond a fairly limited sort of way. Well, she does not take against electoral democracy. She also wants us to see it within her overall understanding of the state. And I think these are significant theoretical uh, moments in her writings. Um, not all of them are unique to her understanding. There are others within the left, within the parliamentary left, who have gestured in these theoretical directions. But what is unique about her understanding is that she foregrounds each of these aspects with passionate conviction. And therefore, when she writes about Dalits, when she writes about caste, she brings to her point of view a certain insistence that these are issues that must be unpacked and understood in all their detail and they cannot be relegated to abstract speculation. And I think this is something very, very important about her writings on caste. And this brings me to the second level of history within which her life and work uh, unfolded, not just the broad history of the left, um, but the way the left conducted its affairs within the context of Tamil Nadu. There is, of course, a CPI, and out of that, later on, the CPM that emerged in the mid 60s. But Tamil Nadu has also has a long history of the presence of Marxist-Leninist parties in the state. Now, many of us, of course, associate the emergence of Marxism-Leninism with Bengal and then to an extent with Andhra and Bihar, but seldom with places like Tamil Nadu or Kerala. And while there is an amount of writing on Marxism-Leninism in Kerala in English, there's almost next to nothing on Marxist-Leninist organizing in Tamil Nadu in English scholarship. But Charu Mojumdar actually visited Tamil Nadu in the mid 60s to find there was already a group of young people, young men mostly, who had broken away, not just from the CPI, but also from the CPM and had constituted themselves as a Marxist Leninist party in the state. And they had set themselves the task of organizing both the agrarian and the industrial proletariat, not just for class action, but to also challenge the state's monopoly on power on violence and the state's very coercive attitude towards militant left revolutionaries. So this was already in place in the 1960s, especially the late 1960s, just at the time when Maithri started getting active in left politics. And there were several publications that the ML groups were bringing out in Tamil. They were also organizing different kinds of actions. In the countryside, this often was limited to what was then called the annihilationist line, which was, of course, ending the lives of 
uh, notorious landlords who were known for extremely oppressive and, and uh, exploitative practices. Um, to some measure, there was a bit of organizing around issues of labor, but nowhere as expansive as what the All India Kisan Sabha, which is a part of the parliamentary left, had managed to achieve. Nor was an engagement, nor was there a consistent engagement with the long history of agrarian organizing in parts of Tamil Nadu, such as East Tanjavur. While much of the militancy emerged in East Tanjavur, not all of it referenced the longer history of left presence in that, um, in that region. So there were certain limits to ML organizing in, in, uh, in the Tamil context, in the agrarian uh, worlds of Tamil Nadu. In the industrial context, there were very interesting independent trade union initiatives. Um, Kalpana referred to Kuchelar, who was a, started out as a Trotskyite labor organizer. There were others who were also organizing in particular industries during this time. And what was important, um, what is important for us to recognize is Maithili as a organizer with the CITU. I mean, she wanted to work in the countryside, but basically she came to work in industrial, um, um, the industrial areas in Chennai city. And she was a very popular uh, leader of the industrial laborers in, 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 in uh, the city of Chennai. And here she and the CITU often engaged in both contentious as well as cooperative action with these other industrial trade unions. And so you will find that um, Kuchelar and she are probably part of a common strike committee in some instances. You will also see that there are points of, uh, of, of differences between trade unions which considered themselves Marxist-Leninist and those that were part of the CITU. So all of these were played out on the ground and Maitri was very acutely aware of these tensions on the ground. And she retained a broad left perspective for the most part, except when, of course, her party made a decision as to how the trade union ought to interact with this or that independent trade union. And I think these were very practical lessons in being part of a communist party. And I think Maitri was a very committed party activist. And as Kalpana said, she was a partisan activist. And that partisanship was not only in terms of her relationship to the working class, which I think she held in great respect and affection. And I use the word affection because it was not just the relationship of a party thinker and activist with the working class, but also as someone who stood with the working class and in whose writings you hear the voices of the working class. Kalpana speaks of her writings on East Tanjavur. And one of the most fascinating aspects of that text is the way she makes room for the voices of laborers and kisans to emerge within the spectrum of her writing. She's not summarizing them for us. They actually speak to us, likewise with her text on the plantation laborers. So her relationship with the working class was both an affective relationship as well as a political relationship. And when we were writing this, putting Maitley's articles together, both of us had a chance to talk to individual working class uh, leaders and organizers. And one thing that we found time after time was everyone recalling her with both respect and affection. And I think there was that link that she tried to forge with the working class and, and which was an organic political link and not simply one that uh, positioned her as the organizer, whereas the working class was something that had to be organized. I think she saw a two-way process at work here. And as Mao used to say, from the people, to the people, to the people, and from the people. So I think Maitli took that very, very seriously. And as an intellectual, you see that in her work, not just in the writings that she wrote in English, but also in Tamil, which were read avidly uh, across a wide spectrum of people, both from within the CPM, from, from within the CPM and beyond the CPM as well, but also in the manner that she addressed uh, the common public. Maithili did not think that you had to talk down to the ordinary public, that the ordinary citizen was capable of comprehending complex issues, provided they were communicated well. So she would actually unpack issues with great subtlety and in as simple a manner as possible. So you see her then actually entering the Tamil public popular world of activism from within a broad left understanding, but also keeping within party discipline and what was required of her as a member of a particular communist party. So you see that happening here. And I also heard from Marxist Leninist uh, activists from that time, that uh, many of those who were in the ML, but who uh, were very wary of the CPM, 
CPIM for that reason, could not help but be drawn to Maithili's writings. And many of them wondered if the radical review had not been started, particularly to sort of douse the fervor of the ML organizers. This is something that one of them told me while I interviewed them about those times. But what's interesting for us is to see how she was also responding to the Tamil scene, again, not in an abstract sense, not by just responding to articles in Tamil publications and so on, but in and through the practical labor of being in great meetings, of being present as part of trade unions, writing about what the capitalists were doing, as Kalpana pointed out, uh, pointing to the working class, how do you then understand exploitation, not just in a general sense, but also in a particular sense, how was this company able to get away with extracting surplus and posting profits while they refused to raise the wages of workers? So these were things that were not only written off in English, but spoken off at gate meetings, discussed in trade unions. So Maitley was a great pedagogue. She was a great, um, you know, to use a term from Gramsci, she was a great permanent persuader where she persuades the working class to conceptualize things, to act as a class force. The great feminist historian Sheila Robotham often spoke of not just socialist movements, but she spoke of people in movement. And I think Maitley was very concerned about separating what communists bring to politics, which is very substantial, but also what people in movement bring to labor organizing. And if you don't have people possessed of that sense of political sovereignty, you know, that they are the voice of the working class, a struggle was not likely to succeed. So I think for her, it was very important as an organizer to draw from practical political and trade union organizing lessons for communist politics, which is what she does in all her writing on, on unionism. Uh, uh, and I think she did that not just in her English text, but in her Tamil writings and as important in her Tamil speeches. And many of these addresses to workers were also leavened by her feminist understanding. And while not all of this is present in her writings uh, on particular trade union issues, uh, people that we spoke to often told us how she had this manner of sitting down with comrades and insisting why they must take the gender question seriously. And later on as an organizer with Aidwa, she combined the labor caste and class questions with great uh, prescience. And any of the issues that Edwa picked up, whether it is against the two tumbler system, whether it's for women protesting against um, uh, alcohol, whether it's organizing women on the ground in any particular instance of labor, the Edwa never lost sight of the combination of caste and class. And I think this is something the Edwas uh, in Tamil Nadu, and I think I'm told by friends in Rajasthan are particularly known for that they did not seek to separate these issues. And I think that's very important for us to keep in mind. And I would like to think that um, this understanding owed a great deal to the political understanding of uh, and the political practice of someone like Maitri Sivaraman and also of another senior Edwa leader, Papa Umanath, who had a great admiration for Periyar and his politics of gender and his critique of Brahmanism. And also, responding to the Tamil political scene, you have Maithili using arguments that help us understand Brahmanism in ways that very few communist leaders of her time or subsequently have done. She's a very strong critique of Brahmanical Hinduism. This you see in all her writings. She does not mince words in criticizing Brahmanical hegemony, nor does she sort of seek to be apologetic and say that I'm talking about Brahmanism, but not about individual Brahmins. She's very clear that Brahmanism is born by individuals who then have to take responsibility for that and consciously declass and decast themselves as she attempted to do all her, her entire life. And I think she took that politics of self-transformation seriously, not in this narcissistic sense, but in the sense that for to be an Socialist also required you to consciously declass yourself and decast yourself in your personal life, in the way you talk, in the way you uh, relate to your constituency. Kalpana spoke of Nagamal appearing at her doorstep. And I think um, her house was open to the working class at all times of day and night. And I think that is a very important thing for us to keep in mind as well, because I think that's also what marks out Maitri as a intellectual was both responsive to uh, her times, her immediate context, which is Tamil Nadu, but also 
who try to leave the socialist life. The socialist life is not something that can be separated from socialist politics. One has to leave that life in a certain kind of way and might leave does that in a very, very rich sense. Um, and I think that's something that is very important to remember as we read her writings that the gap between her writings and her own life was, was not very wide or not very deep. Um, I'm sure there's a gap, there's a gap in all of our lives that way, but not in, in a sense that is of particular significance. And I think that's a very, very important thing to keep in mind. Now, I just want to call attention to a few things before I end. One is that um, Maitley's um, uh, understanding of caste and Maitley's understanding of gender. Now, her writings on caste in this volume pertain to two sections. One is um, writings on Dalits, which is the first part of the book, and um, the way she conceptualizes the non-Brahmin Dravidian movement. And uh, I want to spend a few minutes on both these issues um, because I think they're very, very interesting. And here you see how Maithili negotiates her way through the history of communist thought on the subject and the realities of Tamil politics and society in a very, very interesting way. So her essay on Periyar, which she co-wrote with Karunakaran, is a fascinating socialist unpacking of Periyar. Um, she makes it very clear that Periyar's critique of caste, Periyar's critique of Brahmanism, the broader Dravidian movement's espousal of Tamil nationalism are not insignificant issues. They are major issues that anyone wanting to be politically active in Tamil Nadu have to contend with and engage with. And, and, and she comes to that question of engagement after the critical assessment of Tamil non-Brahmanism and, and, and Periyar's own uh, thought and practice. Well, today we might uh, think of Tamil non-Brahmanism in a differentiated way because of the kind of scholarship that has since emerged on that subject. For Maithili and Karunakaran writing in the 1970s, it was already a radical step to foreground Periyar as someone whom the communists had to take seriously um, because that was not what was available to communists elsewhere in India when it came to the caste question. The communists did not seek to engage, say, with Lohia seriously, except during election times in, in northern India. Nor was caste a matter of concern in Maharashtra, where communists often had to work with Ambedkarites uh, or with Fule Ambedkarites, but theoretically that was never really unpacked um, except by Ambedkarites who identified as communists. So I think in the context of Tamil Nadu, it was very important that Maithili and Karunakaran push Periyar into the foreground and say that these are questions that socialists have to address seriously. Their own understanding of Periyar, it would appear to me as somebody who's um, been studying Periyar and his writings and histories to be somewhat limited by the broad left understanding of caste itself. But Maithili and Karnakaran redeem that broad left understanding, which is limited, which does not see caste as linked to the mode of production by asking these questions. So Maithili and Karnakaran pose these questions towards the end of that essay we need to establish the manner in which caste articulates with capitalism. And we need to also they hint without getting into details beyond the familiar left argument about caste society being a semi-feudal society and have we transitioned or not to capitalism and therefore thinking of caste within those broad abstract arguments about the mode of production. Maitli is not interested in those abstract arguments. She's, un she's more interested in more situated historically specific arguments. And the Periyar essay is important precisely for this reason, because Maitli will not allow us to get away with an easy slogan such as Lal Salam plus Jai Bheem. She would want us to unpack caste as a relationship of production and ask us then to think through the modalities of organizing against caste and on a class basis and point to us this is not likely to be an easy task, but nevertheless, it's a task you cannot run away from. I think that's very, very important for us to keep in mind. Now, her understanding of gender is not only uh, in terms of the theoretical essay that is there in this, in, this, in this collection, but also in her writings on women within broader struggles, whether it's the plantation industry, whether it's in East Tanjavur, whether it's the way women have taken up uh, uh, rights issues as with Nagamal um, and Bagyam. So there's a way in which she foregrounds women not as victims alone, but as conscious political activists. And I think this is again a very important aspect of her writing because she does not think that uh, feminism is 
a ghetto science, which only the Edwa has to practice, but that a feminist understanding must pervade all aspects of socialist practice. And while one might debate with her understanding of feminism, which is within the broad classical Engels uh, framework, the fact remains that Maithili sees feminism as central to our understanding of the class and caste questions, which is why I think she um, takes Periyar very seriously, especially his writings on caste and gender. And uh, elsewhere in her Tamil writings, she's written widely on how one might work with Periyar's writings for a broader social transformation. So I think this particular essay, um, we might want to sort of open up to debate in view of Indian feminist writings on, on gender today. And in Maitri's own time, there were very critical voices such as those of um, those who emerged from within the broad CPM spectrum to, to express their uh, uh, critique of what they thought was a party position on gender. And in some ways, Maitri's paper tries to justify the party position on gender without making it uh, a kind of a party document, but Maitri's own thought went beyond that document. And this is what I think we need to also keep in mind when we read that essay. So I will conclude now because I think um, we've now taken over two hours, one and a half hours to one and a half hours uh, um, on, on this subject. And um, so thanks um, for asking me to speak about the book. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Nikita, uh, uh, for a wonderful reading of the works of uh, Mike Lee Shivaraman. And uh, I think, I think uh, her writings, especially on caste, uh, provides uh, some crucial insights for uh, contemporary anti-caste and uh, socialist politics. And, and, and of course, not as ready-made answers, but as points of departures. And uh, now, uh, now is the time for questions and comments. The floor is open. Uh, participants can uh, either type your questions in the chat box or can unmute and ask. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kalpana and Vigida for the wonderful presentations and wonderful discussions on writings of Comrade Maidali. So I have a question, a very broad question. So I was also reading the book and I was stunned by the, the variety of intellectual influence, the political influence on Maidali. And of, of course, we know that she was deeply influenced by Marxism and communist leaders and so on. But also she was pretty, uh, her engagement with Gandhism was also wide ranging. She has, a, as I could see in the book, she has a brief stint with Gandhian movements, Buddhan movement, but she critically distanced herself from it. Nevertheless, retaining what, you know, a dialectical approach to Gandhi is visible in her writings on Cuba. But I haven't seen she directly referring or engaging with Ambedkar's work, at least in the book. So could you tell me about how, what Maidri, uh, of course, her ideas are very similar to her Ambedkar's in great respect, but could you also speak about how Maidri, Comrade Maidri engaged with uh, dear Ambedkar, or if it is absent, how, how do we make sense of that? One way of making sense of that is she understood the caste question very much within the history of anti-caste politics and organizing in Tamil Nadu. She was very familiar with Periyar's writings. And apart from annihilation of caste and a few other texts, many English, the English works were not published until the late 70s and early works. The significant texts were not published and available until the 1990s. Um, I don't think Maitli, I'm sure Maitli read Ambedkar, but she does not cite him in her writings of this period in the 60s and 70s. The thing is for us to think of her engagement with the Dalit question, and the caste question and ask ourselves how that understanding would have been shaped had she read Ambedkar more widely and in a more uh, sort of expansive sort of way. But the fact is that we don't have evidence of her having read his writings. But she had read Periyar fairly clearly and fairly widely. And um, so we'll have to sort of deal with that reality. It's, it's, that's, that's what we get from whatever 
available writings are there and maybe she has written of it in 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 manus there are manuscripts we don't know about we have no idea because we are going from what is available in print so in fact the only uh, serious communist engagement with ambedkar was um uh, in in, a, in an intellectual sense was it was a biography that was published in the 1940s beyond that there was very little engagement from the broad left itself or with ambedkar until much later there may have been a political kind of understanding you know of ambedkarism but there was very almost no engagement with ambedkar i thought until much much later thank you Uh, if there is any other questions, uh, please ask, or even you can uh, type it in the chat box. But before that, I think I, I just wanted to ask something. So, um, so you write in the introduction uh, that uh, uh, Michael Shivaraman uh, takes different styles of engagements when he write when she writes for EPW. and when she writes for uh, the radical review so uh, you write that uh, I'm talk, uh, uh, this question is to be geeta uh, that when mayili shivaraman writes for epw she writes as a journalist who is attentive to the details and allows the arguments or her view to emerge in and through her narratives but when she writes for the radical review she writes as a, a committed socialist and she uh, present uh, her observation through a socialist theoretical framework so i think it if it's a conscious choice i think it's also reflect uh, the different type of audience that journals has received maybe that can also uh, give some interesting insights to the uh, political and historical context of that time and, and of course of uh, this uh, relevance of the journals like uh, radical uh, Review. I, I just wanted to know, like, how do you see this? See, it's a very, very interesting thing to think about because today, when when we think of serious debates around some of these issues, we tend to imagine that such scholarship and writing are only possible within academia, right? But there was a time when there was a strong intellectual engagement with different kinds of discursive spaces. So EPW, as we all know, comprises several levels of scholarship. so you have straight forward reportage you have commentary you have research articles you have book reviews and so on what people like maithili and a few others like say shumanto banerji for example who writes often from bengal or uh, um, mohan ram who also wrote intermittently and from tamil nadu what all of them do is they combine a strong critical and political understanding with specificities of place time context and circumstance and you see how without being theoretical they are theoretical in those essays they curate theory for you the theory informs the way they present facts whereas when you come to the radical review which emerged out of what kalpana was telling us the saturday uh, evening club she was looking to create a constituency of young communist thinkers of people who would fellow travel with the left without necessarily being with it will open up issues for discussion and which could also bring into the tamil context writings from the broad left universe whether in cuba or china or the soviet union or from different parts of india so she was very committed to the making of this communist consciousness in a intellectual and philosophical sense also and the radical review serves that purpose but here also you see that that doesn't mean it is going to be a partisan journal in a flat kind of way you know it will still sort of argue its case um, so it it is going to convince you through argument which is why i sort of see mightily as playing the role of what gramshi said every communist party must that of a permanent persuader it cannot be an ideologue alone the communist party must be a permanent persuader which means you have to be alive to changes you have to be responsive to what is happening but within a philosophical framework that is socialist and i think mightily does that with great adroitness uh, in all her writings and also in her tamil writings you know when she writes of venmani in tamil all these things are still there but it is also written for a popular audience so i think one of the things we we can learn from that kind of writing for different audiences is they do not 
tone down the intensity of their critique or flatten out arguments, but they present it in ways that would reach that constituency best. And I think that is a very big uh, shift from writings from that period. And interestingly, that kind of writing is making us come back with our online journals now. You know, you have space for that kind of writing, say in Article 14 or some, or The Wire or, or, or Caravan and so on. And I think that's a very, very important left tradition, which we mustn't let go of. Uh, hi, uh, everyone. And I'm Dhiren. I just wanted to, uh, and it was a very wonderful talk um, by Kalpana Ma'am and Geeta Ma'am. Uh, I just wanted to, uh, I read the Venmani um, chapter on land and labor. Uh, uh, I just, uh, I just wondering uh, how we can pick up some ideas, basically the uh, politically organized and um, solve the contradiction between the caste and class and how do we pick up some um, you know, key ideas or uh, key, um, um, you know, techniques um, that Maithili Sibaraman had taken up in her work and in the political organiza organization and also in her writing. How do we um, kind of um, adopt some of her techniques if um, both of you, ma'am, can kind of... Uh, uh, it's a more of a practical question, kind of. Um, Kalpana, do you want to answer that? Unmute, unmute. Yeah. yeah. One thing I one thing I can sort of more uh, that immediately comes to my mind was perhaps also the way in which when um, uh, Maithili was very active with the AIDVA in the 1980s and the 1990s, the way in which um, she was able to and also consciously motivated and incited younger Edwa uh, women, younger Edwa members to, uh, to, to think of how to integrate caste and gender and to do it uh, in, uh, you know, creatively in the organizing work that they did, uh, whether it was through surveys and studies that Edwa and Tamil Nadu pioneered at that point of time in the mid 1990s in Vindikal and other districts in Southern Tamil Nadu with respect to just understanding the realities of uh, Dalit women's lives, the uh, many different dimensions of untouchability, uh, practices of untouchability, the gendered facets of practices of untouchability. Um, many, for instance, who spoke at after Maitri's passing in the various Zoom memorial meetings uh, talked about how Maitri was always trying to think through and then to try and was also therefore trying to take along with her her comrades in terms of addressing these, uh, exactly these intersection questions, you know, we can call them that, uh, fairly yeah. vigorously and also creatively. At that point of yes. time, Maitali was not with the Kisan Union because Maitali was never actually a direct organizer with the Kisan Union. She was with, a, right. uh, you know, she was with the trade union and then she was with something called the Working Women's Coordination Committee and then she was with the aid bar. These were her primary fields of action. Um, uh, so the AIDVA, in a sense, particularly gave her, I think, the opportunity to think about it, the space to think about it. And uh, uh, one thing that I, uh, you know, and, uh, and and so there are leads there. My team was also mm -hmm. very central in terms of uh, thinking through along with the AIDVA national leadership on uh, how, how to more directly foreground gender and caste as well in there, both in terms of their conceptual understanding and in terms of, once again, action on the field. Right, uh, right. So that much I know. So there are plenty of hints that we can pick uh, from there regarding that. And one thing I want to know, I also want to, uh, want to do is to also, uh, Viren, is to also address Daya's question here, which is, and I think there's something you've said that relates, uh, you know, it is related to that, which is that Maitri was, as Gita said, uh, known as an eminent sort of pedagogue in her party. I mean, she was uh, she was sort of a legend for her, for the lectures she would give for the not so much the lectures but the party classes you know, the mm -hmm. material that she would pull together right um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, yes. party workers with a party cadre rank and file uh, and uh, but, and it's quite possible that maybe in the later 80s and the 1990s it's possible and i can't be certain about that that 
Ambedkar's work, Ambedkar's writing, finds its way into her notes for the party classes. Uh, okay. And, uh, you know, so that's also in terms of, I would have to, of course, go through the um, pretty much the wardrobes of her material to be able to find out that, you know, find, <laughs> yes, find yes. the relevant uh, papers. But definitely those notes and the way my, because not all the th thinking that she did went into published articles, no, whether in English right. or in Tamil. A lot of it is also, a lot of our ideas are also when we are talking to each other, no, and, and then also, uh, and then when we are preparing for speeches, right? Especially to me, mm -hmm. I find that I do my most creative thinking there. Um, <laughs> yes. You know, so it's quite possible that we're able to actually read those and uncover what Michael was thinking uh, with greater depth. Uh, and uh, hopefully that is uh, something that I will be able to, with Gita, uh, with Gita's help and with Gita by my side, be able to undertake in this lifetime. <laughs> yes, 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 ma'am. Thank one you. One interesting thing, Diren, is Maithili was one of the few contemporary critiques of the Dravidian movement, of the DMK. Mm -hmm. So the DMK comes to power in 1967, right? And it's the first non-Congress government, one of the first non-Congress governments in India. And while she understood the DMK as representing lower caste aspirations and supported its reservation policy and all of that. She was also very wary of what such governments can actually do. Remember I said she was a strong critique of the state as such. So she did not, um, and today I think when you go back and read her articles on the early years of the DMK, you will see that there's plenty for us to think about. For example, her detailed uh, critique of their agrarian policy of um, uh, of the right. commission that was set up and today you have studies which tell you that the agrarian issue was sort of solved by the dmk now that's that's quite interesting that people would say that by which they mean that there was a redistribution of land in certain parts of tanjavur which benefited lower caste tenants those that you would consider mm -hmm. as part of the bc or the obc communities and now the question is what did that redistribution amount to in economic terms because Agriculture, like in other parts of India, is becoming highly unviable on, on the one hand. On the other hand, it has also put a great deal of caste power into the hands of um, OBC communities in these regions, mm -hmm. which have been used against Dalits. And the right. redistribution nowhere um, um, sort of um, was as consequential for Dalits as it was for some of these other communities. So in a sense, today when there's a lot of interesting debates around the Dravidian model, you know, we've all heard of the Kerala model of development. Today you have lots of writings on the Dravidian model of development. And it would be mm -hmm. very good to use Maithi's writings to have a um, debate on that subject, you know, what, what worked, what didn't work, and what was a contemporary sense of the movement, and how do we take that forward and to understand what is happening today because today, welfareism is everything that the state offers. And Maitli was a strong right. critique of that welfareism also, because it was not accompanied by any major changes to do with land or labor. So these mm -hmm. are important questions, not to think of in abstract terms, but look at how she was doing that critique and if we can do a similar critique today. So that would be a very interesting thing. And the other thing to continue what Kalpana was saying is that Maitli never did anything in the abstract. So for example, how do you then support anti-caste uh, uh, politics or anti-caste ideas? So you would have mightily do that by actually being part of particular struggles. So you had this atrocious uh, um, rape and assault of a Dalit woman whose husband was called to a police station and then he was murdered there and then she was assaulted. And the Edward took up that case, but equally important was the way that um, the uh, as well as mightily stayed with such cases, whether it was that instance or the instance of Adivasi girls being sexually assaulted. It was not just taking up the issue, but also staying with the case, being in touch with the victims, continuing a kind of a relationship over decades. And I think these are very important aspects of anti-caste organizing as well, right? Yes, that, yes, uh, yes. So, and I think these are lots of things to be taken away from such efforts. And uh, mightily saw a case through till the very end whatever end there is in sight. Not, some ends only happen 30 years afterwards. But that is a very important thing also for us to keep in mind. So there are many ways in which such writings can prove inspirational. And, and I think uh, like, like the strong communist activist she was, much of what she thought, read, the myriad influences on her writing, all of them were useful to her in as much as they helped her address a concrete issue, right? right. And I think right. that was that's a big takeaway for us. Hmm. 
थैंक यू मैम थैंक यू बहुत हेलो यस आई हैव अ अ क्वेश्चन इट्स डाउट व्हिच कम्स फ्रॉम द स्टेटमेंट इन द बुक इन द सेकंड चैप्टर पेरियर क्लास और कास्ट अगर वर शी मेंशंस अबाउट दैट देयर इज नो रियल कॉन्फ्लिक्ट देयर कैन बी नो रियल कॉन्फ्लिक्ट बिटवीन a brahmin uh, capitalist and a non brahmin capitalist so how to understand that given the fact that our uh, economy is uh, largely uh, mediated by the caste relations and values especially in this neoliberal uh, context so is that statement uh, meaning to take caste out of economy or uh... Uh, no I, i i would read it slightly differently she means to say that where class interests are concerned it doesn't matter if you're brahmin or non brahmin but she doesn't say that there are no other contradictory interests there so she sees that there is a cultural and a linguistic contradiction between a brahmin and a non brahmin but that is not the basis of their permanent contradiction right they can come together as capitalists they may separate out when it comes to political allegiances so i think she wants to, wants us to see that sometimes class interest will cut through caste interest but she was also aware that caste shapes the economy in fundamental ways and how do we understand it is a question that she poses all of us and how do you work with that and how do you deal with it and she does that and again i want to emphasize that in eminently empirical ways if you read her essay on the mrf for example law of the plantation sector and so on she shows you why she thinks that it doesn't matter if the capitalist is brahmin or non brahmin at a certain level of everyday appropriation and everyday surplus extraction now it would become a matter of contention when it comes to say supporting reservation it is likely that a non brahmin capitalist might support reservation whereas a brahmin capitalist might not so at that level of course there would be a contradiction and mightly and the edge i must say was one of the very early supporters of reservation in the tamil context sorry those are interesting important just let it cut again illa ha please mute please yeah so thank you Uh, do we have more questions anyone wants to make any comments hi so i have a red comrade maidili left an illustrious uh, job at the united nations uh, to come work in the social movements in india so uh, so when we are we are students of iit right so how it is how it is how important it is for uh, young people Uh, to uh, contribute to social movements as did comrade maidili yeah kalpana i think you should take this question you teach in an institution so especially since uh, iits are much a political space so, yeah, yeah. i think as uh, students of uh, any institution teachers in any institution iits non iits private colleges arts colleges liberal arts institutions wherever we may find ourselves to engage ourselves with the social and political issues of our time in whatever way that we can we have the energy for we feel we are able to do is something that becomes imperative for us uh, no matter what our institutional location is and uh, no matter where we may be i think uh, what forms it takes of course it's uh, uh, you know that maithili came back from the us when she did in the manner in which she did and threw herself into class politics the way she did was very much a product of her times i should think uh, that uh, there were those movements then the agrarian the, the kinds of agrarian movements and the uh, you know the uh, the trade union movements that uh, absorbed her completely uh and how one chooses to do it in this uh, in this age there are always going to be questions uh but what form it takes you know what what is the authoritarianism that you decide you want to contest and that you want to challenge uh maithili's uh, choices were also determined by the circumstances that faced her by the prevalent social political climate of the country at the point of time that she began her political life and i think everybody's choices may not be exactly the very same and may not follow that very trajectory but i think the fact that there must be an engagement is something that one could not disagree with. 
so that's what i would uh, say uh, and, and mightily never um, never put away anyone engaged with uh, wanting to transform some aspect of social reality is beyond comradeship so for many of us who are active in the women's movements in chennai city she was an anchoring point because she brought together women's groups from such diverse contexts from the ymca on the one hand to the monday charity club on the other and every shade of left in between and fierce feminists like many of us and she found that each of us had something to say something to argue for and there was a lot of strength in coming together and listening to each other so many of us would be very content dismissing something like the monday charity club as upper caste and not really relevant to anything that we are doing but mightly found something valuable because they ran old people's homes they ran orphanages and she was very invested in trying to understand how those places could be made more socially relevant you know and then she chose to engage with them likewise with the ywca the ywca is a very distinctive uh, religious organization christian organization with very set views on certain subjects but because but that was not out of bounds for an organizer like mythly so i think one of the things we can take away from her life is that wherever we are as kalpana said and wherever we feel that we need to voice our uh, our, our, our protest or wherever we feel like some sort of supporting causes or individuals who in the name of justice we should just go ahead and do it and not sort of just wait for that one political moment when we can make a decision because history does not provide us with such moments always sometimes it does many times it doesn't so thank you for kalpana ma'am and vigila Uh, anyone else uh, want to ask a question or make a comment Um, wind up now, uh, Navneet. Yeah, maybe if there is no more questions and comments, then uh, we can uh, wind up uh, this session now. And uh, so, uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Kalpana and B. Gita uh, for a wonderful discussion of a, a brilliant book. And uh, and thanks to all the participants who attended and asked questions, uh, very insightful questions. And I hope. Uh, the this discussion and the life and the work of uh, maithili shivaraman will inspire everyone to read this book and uh, understand it better to shape our own uh, politics and uh, thinking so i think we can stop here and thanks to everyone thanks to all of you that we had a we could actually speak of someone we both love very dearly <laughs> yeah i was going to say the same thing yeah so yeah someone very close to my heart and geeta's heart so it's not always that we have an opportunity to talk about her we talk about her all the time with each other but to be able to talk about her with a larger group and in this manner is uh, is a fairly rare occasion so i think both of us enjoyed it very much yeah. thanks a lot thanks thank you guys thank you, thank you. thanks we'll all really nice upload the entire discussion in youtube and we'll yeah. we'll put in social media yeah we'll send it to you as well yeah thank you yeah yeah share the link uh, dayal sure share sure, sure. Yeah. yeah thanks navni thanks everybody you thank you ma'am yeah. and we we'll see you around sometime bye bye maybe in person next time so <laughs> sure yes yeah bye bye iit ever opens <laughs> <laughs> well even yeah, even the iits must open <laughs> sometime <laughs> all right bye bye and